Hi, I'm Paul Darley, and thanks for tuning into our May issue of Inside Darley. You know, the NFPA is arguably the most important organization in the fire service, and certainly one of them. And we're really excited at the end of this to have an interview with the president and CEO of the NFPA, Jim Pauley, who I've had an opportunity to know over the last eight or so years. Just an amazing man. And in fact, our first attachment here is the NFPA Fire Loss Report. Now, it's from 2019. It came out and comes out in about September each year. And Jim talks about the details in this report. There are 1.3 3 million fires last year, about there were 48 firefighters uh, killed in the line of duty and some other things. And NFPA is celebrating their 125th anniversary this year. Uh, and Darley has been associated with the NFPA for, gosh, over 70 years, almost 75 years, according to our records. And in fact, we've served on different NFPA committees or members of Darley Company has for over 40 years now. And as you look at some, uh, we've also followed NFPA around the world. And as I look at some of these pictures that you see here, this is the very first NFPA trade mission that was into China in 1981. And if you can imagine, there's three Darley employees in this picture. One is my father, Bill Darley, but there's also Ron Voisard, who uh, just turned 82 this month. And Ron is going to be sailing off into the uh, sunset a little bit, working less and less and enjoying his uh, sailing, which he loves to do. And also Jim Wagle, who's involved, heavily involved in our uh, international sales. He seems to defy all aging processes, but uh, great guys to have. And as we look at our NFPA relationship, you know, it's really... Um, been an amazing one where they have gone and, and instituted standards here, not over 300 standards, not just here in the United States, but really around the world. And with that in mind, we're proud to have ju just launched our new Latin American version of our eDarly uh, website. So it's latinamerica.darly.com. If you want to check that out, we'd encourage you to look at that. You know, you're probably trying to figure out what this post-pandemic world is going to look like. And I'll tell you, we're giving you some great attachments here to help you sort that out. The first is a McKinsey uh, document, which has the best articles of the first, 10 best articles articles of the first quarter of 2021. Six or seven of them are just related to COVID. Others are related to your, you know, measuring your digital performance and some other things. I would also, though, encourage you to look. Uh, I, we're not able to share Harvard Business Review articles with you, but I'd encourage you to Google two of them. One is called How to Do Hybrid Right. The other one's called The Psychological Safety of a Hybrid Workplace. So really good articles that just came out in the last week to 10 days from uh, Harvard Business Review. You know, there's also a great document. Our, our third attachment here today is an article put out by J.P. Morgan Chase, and it's called What's Next for Leaders of Mid-Sized Companies, and it talks about five areas that are impacting them, and very similar to things that we're discussing in our own boardroom, that the economy is expected to grow, and you can certainly see that as we look at the CEO confidence level is uh, is soaring here in the United States. It's at a, it's at a uh, five-year high right now, hard to believe, but that's wonderful. Number two, that we're going to continue to see hiring challenges, and they're going to continue to intensify. Number three, companies are going to be, there's going to be a lot more acquisitions. Not Darley's certainly not selling our company, but uh, there will be a lot more acquisitions based on some of the tax law changes that are coming. And there's a lot of private equity money sitting on the sidelines looking to buy companies before the end of the year. Number four is that the global uh, stage is shifting. And in fact, you know, you're seeing this with a lot of companies onshoring rather than bringing products back onto the United States soil rather than having them made in Asia and other places. And this globalization is one of the things we talk about with Jim Shannon in this uh, following interview here. Uh, excuse me, with Jim Pauley in this following interview here. And then the last is uh, digital adoption. So hopefully you'll check that out. You know, trade shows are beginning to open up again. In fact, we're going to have our own home day here on Thursday, June 4th, our Illinois Fire Service home day. We've attached some documents on that. We encourage you to uh, attend that. The FRI, that's the International Association of Fire Chiefs, uh, is going to have their conference down in Charlotte. It's going to run July 28th through the 30th. And then right on the heels of that is going to be the FDIC, which is going to be held in Indianapolis with their whole hot program that's their hands-on training and everything else from August 2nd through the 7th and the trade show portion of that will be August 5th through the 7th and then I just spoke with Eric Schlepp before getting on this today he is the uh, show manager for the FDIC for Clarion and uh, he's confirmed that they have over 5,100 registrants uh, signed up for FDIC in August so far and in fact we're going to have Eric on our uh, Inside Darley in our June issue talking about that show and some of the safety measures and programs that are taking place. So stick around for Jim Pauley. I hope you'll enjoy, I know you'll enjoy his interview. If you have any questions or there's anything we can be doing to support you, we hope you'll reach out to us. 
right, Jim Pauly, I got to tell you, we are so excited to have you as a uh, guest on Inside Darley today. I've uh, admired you for many years, and I'll tell you, we as a business, you know, it's I know it's NFPA's 125th anniversary. Con uh, congratulations to you on that. And the Darley family and the Darley company has been, you know, hand in hand and step in step with the NFPA for, gosh, over 70 years. I, you know, I found documents going back to the early 1950s and late 40s where we worked together. And I, I think of my father, I just shared some pictures of... Uh, my father being on a trade mission in uh, China in 1981. I, gosh, I went and we, you know, as we, you as NFPA went and pushed standards around the world, we at Darley were always step in step, whether it was in China in the early 80s or the, I was in Fire India in the mid uh, or late 90s, excuse me, late 80s, early 90s with George Miller and followed your team on to Brazil and all sorts of places. So it's really uh, wonderful. Um, as we look at the fire loss report, we'll start with that, which is, I think, one of the things that I know I personally look at. What are maybe some of the main things that you see trends taking place within the fire service that, you know, really our, our readers should be aware of? And, uh, and what is NFPA doing relative to those trends? Well, so our, our latest fire uh, loss report and, and line of duty death report, where we talk about firefighter fatalities, um, you know, is our 2019 report. You know, the good news is that we are seeing um, line of duty deaths on the decline. Uh, overall, we had the lowest number of deaths in 2019 of volunteer firefighters, lowest number of deaths in road vehicle crashes and in cardiac deaths. And, and seeing that go down, I think, is, is a great news across the board for the fire service. The real concerns that we start to see of this coming up is, is, and we're starting to look at it a little more in detail, is kind of the overall issue of firefighter health and safety. So, so the 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 mental well-being of firefighters, the cancer issues that are that are coming in now more and more so on the mainstream. Those are the areas that we're starting to take a little bit of of a different view in and trying to understand a little better because it's some, to your point, it's some of the bigger impacts that I think we're going to see on the fire departments coming in the future. That's great. And as we look at the, the documents that you're coming out with, NFPA 1700 being shared openly with all firefighters and anyone interested really free of charge. I mean, can you talk a little bit about that movement, uh, particularly as it relates to 1700 and other standards that maybe are being made available at no charge for this I know all documents are relative to safety with NFPA, but if you can talk to some of those emerging trends, whether it's EV or other things. Yeah, so a couple of things. Uh, one, I'll, I'll remind everybody that all of our NFPA documents, all 300 plus codes and standards, can be viewed free online in what we call our free access tool. So every code and standard that we offer, you can uh, go online, you spend two minutes setting up a profile, and you can go in and read the standard. You don't, You can't download it or print it, but you can look through every part of the standard. So that's been, we've been doing that for more than a decade. Uh, and, and it's important for folks to know. Some of the later things that you're talking about has really been in some of the training areas where we've tried to focus on the newer technologies that firefighters are having to face in their role as going to fight fires. So you mentioned electric vehicles. A few years ago, we did a great online uh, electric vehicle training series, still available online. We had, I think, 33,000 uh, folks in the fire community and the fire departments that took that training teaches people about electric vehicles, right? These are different. A, a car crash involving an EV is not a car crash involving a gasoline vehicle. And so the concerns you need to be aware of, how you extract people from those, some great field guides that go along with it. We've done that with uh, LNG vehicles as well, some training. We've done it with energy storage systems. There's the uh, event that we had out in Arizona that injured eight firefighters when it was an energy storage system that exploded uh, as they were going to uh, to a call there. And now with 1700, 1700 is a much different foray for us. Some great research that has been done by the UL firefighter uh, uh, safety research uh, area that they have. We've taken a lot of that research and turned it into a guide now that's talking to people about some of the firefighting tactics with the science behind it. We now have an online training series that just came out in the last couple of weeks that's available for fire service folks to take for free. It was made available because of a grant that we actually applied for and got. We did that training and it talks about this new research and new technology. So it's, it's much different for NFPA 
today than it was just a decade ago and how we're kind of looking at this picture and how we can help first responders. You know, and as I look at how you've moved your, and I know, I'm sure it was a difficult decision to, you know, uh, take your uh, show that was scheduled in June virtual. Can you talk about some of the technology and some of the things that you're doing along those lines to continue to educate your, your members and others in the fire service community? Yeah, so Paul, you mentioned earlier, it's our 125th anniversary. And so because of COVID, not being able to do our show last year, not being able to do it this year, uh, a big blow to to us because we love that in-person contact with people that that show brings. And and you, we get seven, eight, eight, ten thousand 10,000 people uh, at these shows and, and it's an incredible event. So this year, not being able to do it, we've actually created what we call our 125th anniversary conference series. So starting in May, Every month, there will be a day-long virtual conference that will occur. Each topic matter, for instance, in May, it's Electrical Safety Month, so our topic is on electrical. And an entire day of experts from around the industry, of roundtable panels, of things that people can get, they can get CEUs for those programs as well. So we're really using a great platform to allow people to interact and to gain that, that education that they're used to getting at our show. All of this is going to com culminate. Uh, there are 10 of these that are going to go all the way into 2022, and we're going to culminate it in Boston live in our 2022 conference as sort of the cap to our 125th anniversary. So I'm looking forward to, to getting back to everybody in person. Well done. And as I look at the you know organizations who have pivoted, I, I see very few have done it as well as you, and I get a little bit of insight. A lot of our readers here are you know, most familiar with NFPA 1901. We've had representatives on that uh, committee for our company. Peter Darley serves on it. Jason Darley is an alternate uh, for a number of years. I know that those have gone virtual and uh, perhaps even more effective. Can you talk a little bit about maybe specific changes in 1901? I think they're, I think it's scheduled for release in January of 2023, the next version. Right. And maybe just a little bit about how that collaboration has worked virtually. Is it Has it been yeah. as effective as you anticipated or more effective or... So just as you said, everybody's had to pivot and our team had to pivot pretty rapidly to not only our annual conference, but how are we going to do all these technical meetings? Because one of NFPA's strengths over 125 years is bringing people together. And now how do we do this in a virtual environment? So our team shifted. We've been using virtual platforms to bring the committees together. The committee volunteers have been incredible at working in that environment. And, you know, do we think that will stay? We're actually in a lot of discussions right now about what's that need to look like going forward. People are telling us on the committees they miss the in-person collaboration, particularly for a lot of the bigger projects that, that go on. People were also telling us we've had our highest number of participants in our committees that have been going on through this virtual environment as well. So we're going to have to find a way to deal with both of those pieces. Small projects versus large projects, we may be able to see a difference in there. You know, the National Electrical Code is a good example. It has 17 different committees. They meet over two full weeks uh, of meetings to do this. That's hard to do virtually, right? Yeah. They've been doing it, but I suspect that's a good example of a big project that'll go back to, to in person. But we've been getting good feedback. I commend the volunteers on the committees for this uh, in doing it. You mentioned 1901. That's actually part of an even bigger effort that we have going on our fire service standards. We have about 110 standards that serve the fire service community themselves. One of the things we heard from people is, look, I got to go to one standard to understand the particular uh, PPE equipment. Then I got to go to another standard, perhaps to do selection, care and maintenance or another standard for additional requirements. This consolidation project is going to move a lot of those standards all into one place. There are still committees for parts of it, and it'll all be between two covers, but broken out. Like 1901 will become part of a new standard called NFPA 1900, but it'll also have the other things that are pertinent to apparatus and, and those elements in it that might otherwise be in other standards. It's painful as we get there because it's different for our volunteers, but when we're done, you'll be able to have one NFPA standard that'll have a lot of the pieces in it versus it being four NFPA standards before. Yeah. So that consolidation project is a really, really big deal for us. We won't be done with that in all of those standards till way out in 2024, I think. But 
1901 was an example of one. I think it would have normally been done in 2022, and we moved it out a year for part of this consolidation to 2023. That's great. And as you look at your standards, I know obviously NFPA is a global organization and, you know, by our measurements, you know, probably 40 to 45 percent of the, the world seems to write vehicle specifications somewhat either directly tied to NFPA or somewhat loosely tied to it and maybe 50 percent or more, you know, tied to some type of European standard. As you look at, you know, maybe deglobalization taking place with some of this onshoring and other things um, going on here in America, as well as in Asia and other other places. But then you combine that with the technology advancements. What do you see as uh, NFPA's overall adoption rate in the international market? Do you see that as growing through these new technological means? Or um, I, I know you're a re relationship folks, but if you could talk a little bit to where you see that headed. So one of the one of the things that we're doing right now on our committee side is making sure that we continue to get more, uh, you know, for one of a better term, international uh, folks onto the committees. And as you know, with the NFPA process, every interest category has a seat at the table. And we don't we don't do this by country. We don't do this by company. We do it by the interest being represented at the particular table. And we actually now have the highest international representation across our standards um, operation than we've ever had in the previous history. I'll go to your point about adoption. There's two things I've learned about this, uh, Paul, in my time here. And NFPA has always had a huge brand globally. Everywhere I go, people talk out about us being the grandfather of a lot of this stuff. And you mentioned adoption, and what we're finding is it's becoming less about adoption and much more about desire. Because we used to think of adoption that somebody needed to take some regulatory action to do this. We're seeing that being able to converge. Uh, I was in Singapore, and they were a great example where they said, Jim, we kind of have our own codes and standards, but if we have to solve a problem, we go to NFPA, right? And, and that's more of what we're seeing in the tool in the toolbox that's being used. The second thing I've learned is the reason why we're rapidly seeing our standards more widely used, because they're up to date. Yeah. The fact that we do these every three, four or five years, depending on the standard, is a really big deal to folks. And in many places of the globe, they're dealing with standards that are 10, 15, 20, 25 years out of date. And we're being seen as a way to fill that gap with modern standards that look at modern technology and modern problems. And so it, it, it really is a wave that continues to go on and I think will continue to happen into the future. That's great. Well, Jim Pauley, I'll tell you, we really appreciate your time today. I love your candor. I love your leadership style. It's really so authentic, and it's 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 similar to your predecessors. You know, we had an opportunity to work with Jim Shannon and George Miller and all these over the years. And uh, I'll tell you, whoever uh, does your CEO selection does an awesome job because <laughs> it's really uh, you you do things right. And and thank you for all the things. And you always put your constituents and the safety of others uh, at the foremost. And uh, it's really admirable, and you're making a huge difference in the world, and we're seeing it in the numbers that you talked about. I think 48 firefighter deaths in 2019, in line of duty deaths, and you know, with the COVID, uh, you know, in 2020, perhaps you know those numbers will be. I, I think the NFFF just came out with about 174 deaths. I think 140 of those were firefighter related, maybe 50 or so were uh, EMT related. Just one last question: as you look at uh, firefighter deaths for 2020 relative to COVID. Do you see that? Will those be in? Will those be a part of the uh, statistical data that uh, throws us off? Uh, that 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 could skew the numbers? Yeah, yeah. So a bit of that in the way that we look at it, we sort of take the line of duty death definition that um, that some of the that that USFA and some other in, uh, others use, US Fire Administration, others, which is connected to an event that happens generally within 24 hours of the person being on or off shift of what the case may be. NFFF captures a much broader uh, swath of that. And we we and NFFF know that we look at the numbers slight differently. They're actually in concert with each other. It's that there's capture a few more things. We're capturing the COVID deaths where we can as well. We don't think we'll capture all of them, but we are gonna make sure we fit that into the reports. Whether they get defined as line of duty deaths in that more permanent definition, I think remains a bit to, a, a bit to be seen. And, and Paul, as we close this out, I, I'm glad you closed it out in talking about the safety of firefighters and of others, because I want to say to you and, and to all the employees of your company, I know this, 
this all goes out to a lot of your customers and, and other folks you work with, but I know your employees watch too. We want to say on behalf of all of us at NFPA, thank you for what you guys do. The reason why we have these long relationships is because we're all trying to do the same thing. And that is how do we keep people and property safe in this world that we have around fire and these related hazards. And boy, when you've got people targeting that as the goal, a lot of these symbiotic relationships become really crucial to the future. So thank you for your company and for what you do, because we're grateful as well, because what you do helps us accomplish our mission. And that's really important. Well done. Great teamwork. Thank you very much, Jim. We appreciate it. And I look forward to seeing you on the show circuit when we're back at it. Absolutely. Thanks, Paul. Great. Thanks for having me. You bet. Have a good day now.